Our scripture reading today is found in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. At this time, we'll turn over to the pastor. Good morning, friends. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath to all of you here today. You know, I, I really don't um, follow holidays for sermons because I have four churches. But I do want to make this give you. No big deal. <laughs> All right. I'm turning my clicker on right now. I want you to know. <clears throat> but we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? I mean, you think about what happened at Jesus' crucifixion, at his death, how the disciples felt. And yet the next day, there was an empty tomb. Amen. So we serve a risen Savior, amen? amen? So praise the Lord for this weekend, this, this Easter holiday, which we know actually represents what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Isn't that symbolic to baptism? Yeah. Amen. So that's, we're very thankful in the fact that we have a risen Savior, thus giving us the opportunity of the free gift of eternal life. And you know, as we just sang a minute ago, about coming here this morning with open hearts. That's what I'm praying today for each one of us, that your heart is open to the message that God has given me to give you today. I just want to start with a quick prayer this morning. Father in heaven, oh, how we need you desperately. And as we approach your soon coming, we see all the signs around us. We have little time to waste. Help us, Father. Help us to envision where we want to be for eternity. And then give us the procedures to get there. Through Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about stuck in a rut. I don't know if you've ever felt like you've been stuck in a rut, but I know I have. And I want to show you a few pictures here of... This is the first picture, stuck in a rut. Here we go, wrong way. Well, you know, I'm 50% today so far. <laughs> but this is an actual road to Rome, or in Rome. And I would not want to ride a motorcycle, a moped, or a bicycle, or anything of such on a road like that. I mean, if you can imagine hitting some, some of those ruts, uh, you would be in, in deep trouble. Here's an actual road heading into Rome. And you can see these ruts. These actually are ruts from Imperial Roman chariots. And the unique thing about this, of course, they, they had their buggies and their chariots, of course, and the, everything in Rome, in Europe, and in the U.S. are all measured with the same measurements. All these wheels, wheel ruts are in the same measurements. <clears throat> They're 4 feet 8.5 inches wide. With this in mind, you got to wonder why, of course, that's where the wheelbase is. How did they come up with that philosophy? Well, this is the tale of two horses. <clears throat> that's exactly how they came up with 
the width of four feet, eight and a half inches wide. And so it's, it continues on because that's exactly how they measured for the railroad. And I'm not challenging you to take a tape and go on the railroad tracks, but this is how wide the railroad tracks actually are. They use the same, the same jigs, they use the same tools to actually produce the width and, and uh, what was needed for the railroad tracks. And so as they created the locomotive, they built it with that in, in mind, the base. The train is plenty, plenty high. I don't know how high a train is. But they made the, the tunnels just big enough for the trains to go through. And so when they did that, of course, when it came to the space shuttle, the space shuttle actually had two booster rocket engines that went on the space shuttle. And guess how big they could make the, the rocket shuttle, for the shuttle? Exactly, it couldn't be any bigger than four feet, eight and a half inches. So it's quite unique that from the horse and buggy age to the space age, Mankind has kind of been stuck in a rut as to how, how wide the base is. Now, I'm sure our cars are a little bit bigger than that today, so we've matured a little bit. But humanity was stuck in a rut there for a while, and I really believe that humanity is stuck in a rut spiritually. If you look at it from Genesis to Revelation, humanity has been stuck in a rut. In fact, Solomon was a king. He was the wisest man who ever lived, yet he was not a doctor. He was not a scientist. But when you look at Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22, it says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So though he wasn't a doctor, though he wasn't a scientist, yet it turns out that science actually supports the notion of what Solomon stated. So what constitutes a merry heart? Well, laughter. Did you know that laughter is a very healing agent to the hum human being? In fact, with laughter, children laugh 300 times a day. Can you imagine that? It's hard for me as a, as a mature adult to, to imagine 300 times a day because adults only laugh 20 times a day. And there are really times when I'm going through my day and I'm deep in my studies that I don't know if I've laughed at all that day. I might laugh at myself, but... Honestly, laughter is a real powerful thing. In fact, it's very nice to know and delightful to know, to learn, that laughter really is the best medicine and perhaps adds many good years to our lives, as does other health tips. So could it be, could it be so simple that a positive attitude and a joyful lifestyle refreshes our spirit, our soul, and brings life to these old bones, brings life to your bones? I think so. I think laughter is a lot like watering a garden with inside your, your inward parts. It's actually evidence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I was talking with my daughter not long ago on the phone, and she was saying, "You know, Dad, I have some sort of a some sort of a thing on my on my scalp." She said, and and they said it's hereditary. And I said, "Well, you know, my brother, he's got this unbalance in his uh, unbalanced. Um, can't remember what you call it now. It's it's um, uh, chemical. It's a chemical unbalanced." And so I said, it, it kind of brings a little bit of depression. And so she said, well, what you're saying is, on your side, I have problems inside my head. And on, some, on my mom's side, I have something on the outside of my head. And when, when we started talking, I mean, we cracked up laughing so hard. Have you ever laughed so hard that you couldn't inhale? <laughs> and I mean, I bet we laughed for five minutes at least. Uh, and so th this is a good thing. In fact, it's, it's called joy. 
And a couple of a couple of things that I want to talk about with the Holy Spirit today is, is peace and joy. You know, there are nine attributes of the Holy Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, and the self-control. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? It's not fruits. It's not plural. Because you can't say, well, today I think I'm going to have peace. And tomorrow, I think I'll be kind. Or the next day, I'll have self-control because I just couldn't do it today. It's not like going to Walmart and picking out your fruit. I think I'll get bananas and grapes today, and tomorrow I'll get oranges and apples. No. It's a complete package deal. It's the whole package. And so laughter is vital. It reflects joy. It's like receiving the Holy Spirit is watering, once again, our inward parts. Catch what John chapter 7, verse 38 says. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of flowing water, rivers of living water. Nothing dry about that in any respect. The cardiovascular system is the Achilles heel when it comes to health. Why? Did you know that the leading cause of death is heart disease? Japanese research printed in the American Journal of Cardiology showed that laughter increases the beneficial endothelial function. Now, I'm not a doctor, okay? But I had to look into what endothelial really is. And it is a, uh, it is like a, a lining, you could say, of the heart. And within that lining, when you laugh, it actually produces and allows and controls enzymes that go to your heart. And it releases substances. And so what it does is it actually makes your heart healthy. Those watching a stressful documentary had a decline in artery health. Hmm. So, laughter benefits the immune system. It increases cells that fight infection. Now, catch this one, ladies. It increases the anti-aging hormone that keeps us young. There, there is the, the river of life, right? There you go. The more you laugh... The more you're joyful, the younger you're going to remain. In fact, terminally ill patients and nursing home residents have improved outlook, less pain, and longer survival rates when they're laughing. Isn't that unique? So good humor and positive attitude are potent tools to help us Along, And so, attitude determines thought. Thought determines action. And apparently, it also determines our health. So it really is mind over matter, isn't it? It really is. And so the Holy Spirit actually heals us right to the bone. The last part of this verse where it says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone. A broken spirit creates depression, creates sadness, brings separation between loved ones many times. So it's vital. In fact, when you think about it, the Holy Spirit helps to prevent the dry bones, which represents being destitute of the Holy Spirit. Because even when you go through a trial, even when you're tested to the max, if you have God in your life, if you have trust in God, then the Holy Spirit gives you peace even as you go through your trials. Amen? And that's the other aspect that I want to talk about for just a minute, in just a minute, is peace. 
Physical, mental, and emotional health is vital. I agree 100%. But spiritual health ties it all together. We need all four to be complete. And it's a proven fact, statistics show, that those individuals who are Christians, those who attend church and have fellowship and communion with other individuals, have better health. Isn't that unique? So because you showed up today, you may have better health. Praise the Lord. See, there's another, another laugh. It's kind of neat to, to laugh. Don't, don't, don't you think? It's kind of it's neat to, to, when you start to laugh. Have you ever had somebody start to laugh, and because they're laughing so hard, you start to laugh? Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, you feel better about life. You feel better about things. It was Israel's spiritual health or I could say maybe lack of spiritual health, that led them into captivity with Babylon, that led them into captivity with Assyria. They divorced themselves from God. They turned their backs on God. And an unhealthy spiritual condition leads to anxiety, leads to depression, leads to an unhealthy life. In fact... Paul makes this point in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, he says this, Be anxious for nothing. When someone is anxious, they're stressed. Be anxious for nothing. What he's saying is, don't be distracted. Don't be disunited. Don't be divided between you and God, between you and humanity, with anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So there is the procedure and who we go to to prevent the anxiety and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What a beautiful promise that is to help us to rise above the issues in our lives. Amen? Anxiety in the heart of man causes what? Depression. I'm not saying this, but a good word makes it glad. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25. So, you know, every time that you have something negative or hurtful to say to someone, guess where it's going to lead the individual that you just said it to? It's going to, be, it's going to bring anxiety, depression, sadness, and hurt upon their lives. That's the difference between someone who is a real, true blue Christian and someone who's not. I mean... We all can lose it, I guess you could say, once in a while, but self-control is a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. How we handle things is the most important. And so, let's talk just a moment about peace before we go a different direction with, with the broken spirit. <clears throat> peace. It's quietness, it's rest, it's prosperity. In fact, what's unique about peace is that it alleviates the issues. It doesn't get rid of them, but it makes it less severe. You know who to go to and where to go to help you to relieve the anxiety, amen? And so peace prevents the anxiety. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. If I could have anything in this world, peace would be my first choice. But this is a wonderful thought because this takes it into a different level. This type of peace is a tranquil state of a soul assured of salvation through Christ. 
It relieves us of all fear. We have peace through reconciliation with God. That's a very, very powerful thought. And if you want peace in your life, then go to God and be reconciled. Then he may send you to man, whoever you may be, have problems with, and have peace with them. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27. And this is in all red letter, if you have a Bible that has red letter, but to emphasize it, I wanted to put these words in red. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. What is his peace? It's his own peace. The world has peace. If a tornado goes through the city and your home is missed, Whew, boy, that gives me peace. The next day there's floods coming and your house is right in line. The peace doesn't last in this world. But peace with Christ lasts for eternity. It's peace of, it's assurance of salvation. It's assurance of reconciliation. It's assurance that God loves us. It's assurance that not, not to let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because you have the peace of Christ in your life that changes everything. In fact, peace soothes the soul. I wonder... Through this pandemic, have we lost our peace? Do we need a revival and reformation in our lives today? Remember, I told you the second step, the first step a few weeks ago was the triumph over Laodicea. Remember that? And we went through the, the steps that, that need to, to occur for that to happen. And so if we've lost our peace, which I hope we haven't, we still need revival and reformation, don't we? I'll show you why. We need it individually, and we need it corporate, corporately in our churches. In fact, that's the only thing that's going to pull us out of the spiritual rut that we're in today. Revival and reformation is vital. So what is revival? Well, revival is a renewal of a spiritual life. I mean, if, if you don't have a spiritual life, you are spiritually dead. There's, there's this show on television, and I, I, hate, I, I try to get past it as quickly as I The Walking Dead? It's about the ugliest thing I think I've ever seen. Uh, well, maybe you watch it. I apologize. Almost the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Okay? The walking dead. But you know the truth of the matter is, everyone who does not have Jesus Christ is the walking dead. That's the real truth. And so if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life, you might be alive and walking, but spiritually you don't have it. Spiritually you are not alive. And so a spiritual revival is needed. A resurrection of the spiritual death has to occur. Or guess what? When Christ comes, you're not going. That's all there is to it. And then we need reformation. I remember when I made my decision for Jesus, and I did it one time, two times, three times, four times. I think I have been baptized more times than Carter has pills. Okay? But when I got baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, I knew it was the true church. And so when that happened, and I realized, hey, you know, that's why we have 28 fundamentals, friends. 
That's why people go through and, and, and study it before they get baptized. Because you can go to some churches, and I've had people say, well, you know, Pastor, um, I've been to churches where the first time you're there, they make a call, you come down, and they baptize you. What are you being baptized into? Well, I'm not sure, but it was a, this is the name of the church. What do they believe? Well, I don't know. Well, shouldn't you know? Yeah. Yeah, you should know. That's why we do what we do. And all 28 fundamentals come from where? Where do you think they come from? The Bible. I've had many people say, well, you know, Pastor, I, I agree with about two or three or four maybe of, of the doctrinal beliefs. You know, I'll be there on Sabbath. That's great. You're a Sabbatarian, but you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. If you do not coincide and believe with all the, the doctrines of the church, you are not agreeing with the Bible. You can't turn any of them away. They're of the utmost importance. And so when I came to the reformation of my life, that means reorganizing. You know, I am not very organized. In fact, I'm going to tell on myself, before I came out today, I had Brad help me to put this in the right pocket and put this on the right side. So, you know, I told you, Brad, I, thanks, don't tell anybody. So I'm telling it myself. So now you can tell everybody you want to tell. <laughs> I'm not organized. Fortunately, I married somebody that is. That's why I married Well, that's one of the reasons why I married her. She has kept me organized for almost 45 years. That's why she's got a couple of gray hairs. <laughs> she can blame me all she wants, because it's, it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're walking home. All right. So when I reorganized, I reorganized everything. I had changes in ideas, in theories, in habits, in practices, in desires. Everything that needed to be changed was changed when I had reformation in my life. And so... When you have this revival and this reformation, it's the perfect blend. They go hand in hand. In fact, you cannot have one without the other. Do you catch that? You really can't. If you have, if you have this spiritual revival and there is absolutely no reformation, I guarantee you, you've lost it. Because changes have to occur. That's all there is to it. I had to change almost everything. And so this is nothing new with reorganization, with reformation. In fact, when the medieval church got off the mark and they turned their backs on the God of heaven and on the Bible, the Lord God raised up men and there was a revival and a reformation. True or false? Names like Tyndale, Huss, Wycliffe, Calvin, Jerome, Zwingli. How about Luther, who on October 31st, 1517, he took this hammer. He had 95 theses. He goes to the church of Wittenberg. He goes to the door, and he goes to pound that in, and he says, I... Uh, Nah. Nah, I know the church has problems. I guess I'm just not going to make a big deal of it. Now, what if he would have done that? But he didn't. He nailed those 95 theses to the door. And the Reformation, it was like a race. It began. Where would we be if those men wouldn't have stood up for the truth? There came a revival and a reformation, and you can look at it. In fact, the book of Revelation reveals that it's going to happen, and it did happen. In Revelation chapter 6, the black horse represents the dark ages and the time period without the gospel. And in Revelation 6, the pale horse represents the results of the black horse not having the gospel. It's called death. 
This was nothing new. History was repeating itself. This is, the, this is like the Jews in Jesus' time were stuck in a rut with their ceremonies and with their traditions. It's exactly where the church was. And then you can go back as far with Israel. You can go back to Isaiah or Jeremiah uh, or, or go back to Exodus where they decided after they came out they're going to worship a golden calf. You can go on and on uh, in Deuteronomy uh, and, and go through the con complete Old Testament and you'll find the rejection of the God of heaven. The church rejected the Word of God. They rejected the Bible. And so, the question I guess today is, if they're not regarding the Bible as it really is, how should it be regarded? Well, let's look for just a minute. The Bible should, re should be regarded as the Word of the living God. Amen? Amen? The word that is our life. The word that is to mold our actions. The word to mold our words and our thoughts. To hold God's word as anything less than this is to reject it. Education, page 260. Check it out. How serious... Are we taking the word of God? How important is eternal life? Because I want you to note this morning, my friends, that God takes it very serious. God wants to save us. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that God can save. That's why Laodicea is so, is so dangerous, remember? To triumph over Laodicea. They didn't know, according to Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, they didn't know that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They saw themselves as, I'm okay. Hey, it's me, God. You know, I can't be perfect. It's me. Let's be careful. And so I want to show you this morning a little bit more of the dry bones. If you would turn into Ezekiel, and I want to show you something in Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And I'm going to begin with verse 24. You know, I love that because having, having little babies, it, it, we have life in our church, don't we? <laughs> I mean, scream it out, you know. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> anyway. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. What is water? What does it represent? The Holy Spirit. It's like the early rain. He is going to rain down upon them his spirit. Clean water, clean spirit, and take away them from all the filthiness from their idols. Verse 26. Verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of, the, of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is the ultimate physician actually performing a heart transplant. And when we receive that heart, it's the heart then that yields up. It yields to the Spirit of God. And that transforms us. So in verse, in chapter, um, let's go to chapter 37 of Ezekiel. Catch this. 
Verse 1, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of what? Bones. And in verse 2, we find that they were very dry, very dry bones. And he said to me in verse 3, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Lord God, you know. Verse 4, and again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Let me tell you, when God created Adam, Adam was no more than just inanimate flesh laying on the ground until... God breathed the breath of life into Adam. And not only did he provide oxygen, but he imparted life to Adam. And he became a living soul. He wasn't a living soul before that. Then he became a living soul. Then it goes on to say in verse 6, I will put my sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Sinews are tendons. Tendons hold the bones together. I got proof of that because of my rest. I lost my bones in my rest because I lost my tendon. It snapped. The Holy Spirit holds us together. God holds us together. And he's giving Ezekiel a little pictorial of the creation. It's, it's beautiful because when you think about it, God spoke everything into existence, didn't he? He spoke everything into existence. And then he said, uh, let the earth bring forth the grass. Let the earth bring forth the, 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 the animals. But, but God, God formed man out of the earth. He formed him. That means that he used his very fingers. You find that, I think, in... Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where he formed him. In other words, when he formed him, that means, that means that he's squeezing into shape like a potter. He's molding. He's, he's fashioning him just exactly the way he wants him to be. Adam meant more than any other creation. And in verse 7, so I prophesied as, as I was commanded, and I prophesied, and there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. He's, he's visualizing, he's seeing the creation step by step. And then in verse 9, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Many people think that a soul is separate from the spirit, but if you look in the Greek, you look in the Hebrew, they mean the same thing. A soul is breath, a soul is wind, spirit is breath, spirit is wind. It's the same thing. And so, he's saying, oh, breathe on these, oh, oh, breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Isn't that what we're doing today with the three angels' message? Aren't we breathing a breath of life to those that we come across? I mean, if we look at Revelation chapter 14, let's turn there for just a moment. Revelation chapter 14, let's, let's check this out. Revelation chapter 14 and beginning with, with verse 6. And it says there in verse 6, Then, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tongue, nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. 
and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of the water. That brings life to the people that accept the truth. And that's what's happening here in verse 9. It's bringing life. Ezekiel 37, verse 10, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them. And they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. And in verse 11, he said, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. But they're not cut off. Their hope is not lost. Their bones are not dry if they accept the God of heaven. Because it goes on to say, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from the graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and have brought you up from your graves. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And only those who have the Holy Spirit will go up with the Lord because his feet does not touch the ground. We go up to him. It's like a magnet. The Holy Spirit is like a magnet. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you are drawn up to the Lord. That's why we know in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 and 4, 30, that the Holy Spirit is our seal with God. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. He wants us to be back in the Garden of Eden. That is our land. That is where we're from. That is what we've lost. And that is what we're going to gain when we have the Spirit of God within us. It's called eternal life. Do you want to be there? Praise the Lord. Because it takes a lot to be there. A lot of reorganization in our lives to make it happen. Amen? Revelation 22, 17. I want you to know something. A long time ago, when I was selling books, I went to this home. And I went to this home, and I, I had this card, you know, and any time I got a card, it's like an invitation to go to somebody's home. It's just like a Bible study. And so, oh, I got an invitation. I'm going to go to this home. And I went to this home, and I knocked on the door, and nobody was there. Well, that was common. But my theory was this. If nobody's home, then you go to the door next door. You go to the door next door on the other side. You go to the door across the street. You go to all the doors because maybe that's where God really wants you that day. And so I went next door, and I knocked on the door, and this, this young lady opens the door, and, and I give her my spiel. Hey, I'm with Home Health Education Service, and, and we're working on preventing dr drugs and crime and delinquency. And do you got just a moment? Yeah, oh, yeah, sure, come on in. I came in, and there are two people in there already with black pants, white shirt, and black tie. Who do you think they were? <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know they were Mormons. I mean, it's just like they should have put a stamp on their forehead. I'm Mormon. And I knew it. And so I walk in, and I stand there, I'm looking at them. And they look at me, and they say, hey, that's a nice tie. You know, it had lions, and it had a lion and an elephant and some other. I said, yeah, it's an endangered species, endangered species tie, like lions and tigers, bears, elephants, and Christians. And they said, hey, um, we got to go. And they got up and they walked out. And I sat down with these two, this couple. They purchased some books that day. They made a decision for Jesus that day. They ended up getting baptized into the church. They got married because they were living together. They got baptized into the church. And then about two weeks later, he died of cancer. But you know what? He refreshed his soul with the Spirit of God. I know that I'm going to see him again. And that's what Revelation is trying to tell us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, 
come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. It's a gift that's given to us freely. Letting God sprinkle clean water on us. Letting God make a difference. Giving us a new heart. Putting into us a new spirit within us. Changing us. Hey, Lord, this morning my prayer is to have that divine operation on me. Amen? Let's turn to our closing hymn. Number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your desire to bring us home, for your son who came and died for us, and for your sweet Holy Spirit that fills us, that anoints us, 
that actually attracts us to Jesus Christ and prepares us for his second coming. Transform our hearts and our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.